Happy New Year. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. Mm. Mm. Good to see so you. good to see so... you, yeah. If you want to look at your other pages of yogis or page, not sure what. Right, it might be a small group today with the revelers. Right. Revel in silence. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, well, I was um, inviting inviting you to approach your own body, heart, and mind like a um, weather system, a constantly changing weather system. And of course, wherever you land in that weather system is fine, but I'll suggest some things that, first of all, to just see if you can um, just find some just quiet, doesn't have to be intense, very light gratitude for being here on our planet. Just the fact of it, the preciousness of our human birth. And relating to our own body, mind, heart as a little planet Little star, little planet. Within this vast universe of stars and planet beings. And gratitude for our Sangha and the all of us wanting to sit together with this intention to understand, allow our experience rather than caught in the knee-jerk reactions, the conditioning to how things are. So letting the quiet gratitude let that just let you, let the awareness be kind. It's like invitation, kind to whatever appears during our sitting. And it doesn't have to be strong 
It can be almost neutral. It can be very kind, but I'm saying it, it's not like we have to make something happen. You just call it, call it up, see what happens. Letting our attention notice this vast system of earth, air, fire, fire, and water within the air, the wind, with our breath. Finding the movement of your breath at the abdomen. And of course, it's just a word, air or wind movement pressure, tension. Expansion, contraction. So that mysterious emerging of life itself. Mm. It said the Dhamma is good in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end, and we can experience that with one, one breath at a time. simple training of being with the beginning and the middle and the end of a breath. And you can notice that with body sensations, that range of warmth, coolness, cold, hot, especially in winter. the movement of the mind and 
the awareness with a soft and hard, rough, smooth, again, just letting the sensations emerge wordlessly, but understanding. Rather than my nose, my foot, my breath. The elements are coming and going by themselves, flowing like water. are stuck like a beaver dam. So receiving our little planet with sounds Beginning, middle, ends, thoughts, chitta, awareness colored by kindness, sadness, anger, gratitude. Sadness, joy, all part of the weather and soundtrack. The awareness does not have to be sticky. And if it is, it's okay just noticing the attention, identify. And then understand that it isn't me or mine or I. And unstick. And back into that sixth sense door flow of awareness.
Thank you, Michelle. Mm. So we thought as uh, this moment of transition between calendar years, uh, it would be good to just take some questions from folks if you had any about your practice that we might be able to help with. Um, I'm sure, you know, we've had a couple of weeks since our last gathering and lifetimes have transpired <laughs> for many of us in those couple of weeks. So I'm sure there's lots of material out there. So um, just as uh, Suzanne did, if you want to ask a question, at the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions button. You can click on raise hand there. And we'll know you have a question. If that doesn't work, you can just try to type something into the chat to let us know you have a question and we'll call on you. Uh, or you can flail around and we'll keep an eye out. All right. So Suzanne, hi. Happy New Year. Hi, Happy Suzanne. New Year. Happy New Year. Can you say more about relating to thoughts like a weather system. Um, I, I had this image of, um, you know, a weather map and, you know, the clouds circling, ephemeral, moving. And it really helped to break up some of the solidity and the pull of the thoughts. Um, and I've had a lot of trouble for a, a while now in formal practice um, with my thoughts because they've been um, uh, very unpleasant. Um, kind of, uh, yeah, yeah. And practice itself has been a bit unpleasant. Um, um, and so this idea of, of relating to thoughts like a, a weather system and, and kindness for whatever is swirling around, um, I thought that was a little bit of an opening for me. Oh, Michelle, you're muted there. When you have enough um, kind of gumption to see thought more like a weather system and it's more like cloudy, um, and, and so, some thoughts appear that are much more solid and unpleasant, How, what happens then? So I, I get caught in it, right? I'm lost for a while. Um, and what I've, what I've been doing in my practice is um, constantly reminding myself, it doesn't matter what's going on. All I need to do is be kind about what's going on. But I even had a moment when you were giving, um, in this sit, after you gave the instructions, where I observed myself kind of mentally pushing a cloud thought away, right? <laughs> like, no, not, you know, so, so there's a lot of aversion. There's, there, right. you know, there's the not wanting. And then there's the, um, the, the kind of gentle aspiration to be kind with whatever is going okay. on. Okay, so the last question I'd ask before I might say something is, are you noticing at, in that point, um, when you notice the pushing, wanting to push it away, are you kind toward the aversion? I, I am actually aspiring to it. I mean, I am kind of reminding myself of that. Great. Um, but... I guess but, I'm, but I'm asking. There's a difference okay. between like, like, like reminding and actually feeling. You know what I mean? Right, right. Because I think it has a lot. I think that sometimes kindness can't necessarily accept what's happening. Uh huh. 
so we can be kind like if a, if you're wanting to get rid of the thinking because it's unpleasant right and we aspire to be kind for that movement of pushing away an aversion it doesn't necessarily mean that we're accepting the aversion mm-hmm. and that might be where it, it sometimes that's subtle but it i think that um Accepting how unpleasant certain thoughts can be, especially when it's like a time of life where that's like what's happening because of external, maybe external circumstances. I think um, I can relate to that at this point in my life, and I've been, I've been kind of relating to the um, chitta, the awareness itself, like a, a pH, you know, like there's acidic mm-hmm. and alkaline. Mm-hmm. And um, I've just been sort of trying to, I mean, I always feel like a little humor or something, you know, mixing it, like kindness, if kindness doesn't work, then like, where is the resistance, basically, because the resistance is going to be where the suffering is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so bringing, if the, if the kindness isn't making for a kind, it's helping, but you don't feel like it's quite cutting the mustard often. Usually, if you look, you'll see that there's some resistance, that the kindness isn't managing to um, shift into acceptance. Mm -hmm. And so so lately, I've been really playing with um, wanting the thoughts to be more neutral or alkaline rather than acidic, Mm -hmm. and just having... But you know me, I'm more like the type that can imagine like doing a litmus test for my thoughts and go, pulling it out and going, oh boy, it's really acidic this morning. <laughs> what, what can I do, right? But like it helps me see that I'm resisting. Yeah, I don't have quite as much humor about my <laughs> experiences as you do. <laughs> oh. It's taking a lot of work right now to, for me to like, it's yeah. taken some weeks to just like uh, a lot of it has to do with energy and just seeing that there's not that much energy for um, going. Oh boy, I was hoping, I was hoping there'd be like in the li- you know that whole spectrum of possibility. It <laughs> was it was definitely staying way over there on the side that I was just wanting it to inch over a bit. But I think that what yeah, like a, anything you can do to bring some space into it and playfulness often it doesn't necessarily change it but it can help you see that one at least at the least isn't accepting the resistance Mm -hmm. yeah understanding why we are suffering is a lot like even if you can't like um accept the resistance that, that if you understand it, it really brings some um, shift. The shifting is in the, um, it's like understanding the nuts and bolts of suffering. Yeah. Thank you. So you're, I think partly it's just, again, I kept seeing myself wanting to, I wanted to make it less acidic rather than accept that it was acidic. Yeah. And that's what I'm hearing, even though, you know, it's like you're you're wanting the kindness to, to make the painful thoughts go away. Yeah. Maybe, I, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I'm no, just... No, no, because no, I, I noticed, like, like, when I was, for a while I was practicing, you know, I'd be lost in an unpleasant thought, and then I would say the word kindness, and it began to feel like a demand. So that wasn't working. So then I would have to slow it down and say may I aspire to kindness, to just like give it like some space, but. That's humor, that's humor, Suzanne, that's humor. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> no quick fix Are you saying for it's samsara. funny? Or... I'm still okay. looking for it, the quick fix for samsara. Well, it's the, it's the wanting the, it's really just basically wanting it to go away. Yeah. It's painful. It's painful. Yeah. 
I, you know, I would, obviously there's, I mean, I'd, I'd like to actually ask a little bit in a minute about what, you know, like when you said like kind of recently it's been unpleasant and is it, you know, is it, is it a similar thought patterns that are arising over the last period of time? Is it, is it like certain content that is really, yes. uh, you know, that you're sort of like working over and over again? Yes. It is. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think part of it could be interesting to just, you know, like in the recording to go back to Michelle's instruction and sort of get a sense of what might it have been about those instructions that helped you have a little bit of an experience that was different with some of your thought patterns. And I mean, first, just to say, to see your thoughts as a weather pattern is like a very tall order. You know, I mean, that's not, that's not like easy, you know? So to start there as like, you know, to see a rock as something like effusive or, or like, a, what's the word, ethereal, you know, it's not, it's, we don't tend to see it that way. And so it's very, um, it's difficult to, the suggestion that we see it in a very different way than we tend to experience it or identify it or um, kind of conceptualize it. You know, it's a, that's why it's a practice, you know, but I, I would, I would kind of be curious if part of what, you know, I heard Michelle do was, you know, begin with an invitation towards kind of like more tranquility spaciousness and um, gratitude and and to really to sort of see if there's a way that if those those invitations were not in relationship to thought right they were more general right. and then at the point where thought gets introduced the idea is you're maybe already in a little bit of a mind space where there is a relationship to phenomena that is more soft, that is more gentle, that is more fluid, right? That's sort of seeing other phenomena these things. And so that when thoughts then arise, you're already kind of primed for that to be that invitation, right? To see it and experience it in a different way versus unpleasant thoughts arise and you're trying to see them as a weather pattern. You see how like it's different, right? Yes, it's do. like you see something as a weather pattern that's actually maybe easier to see as a weather pattern and you're hanging out in that space. Yeah. And then when the more difficult thing arises, you're 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 already kind of like it's coming into a, a different perspective versus trying to have that perspective arise in the face of the thing that's the hardest to have it be with, you know? Yeah. Um so I have a feeling there might be something there that's useful, right? Of like, don't try to see your thoughts as weather, pa weather patterns. See where there is a natural experience of phenomena as coming and going as soft as out of our kind of like direct manipulative control. And then when thoughts arise, is there a way that we, we still can hold on to some aspect of that dimension, you know, to when those things come in and then we see it as sort of, you know, concretizing. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Here comes a tornado. <laughs> yeah. It's, but I mean it. Yeah. You know, if you look at those maps and it's like, okay, everything's kind of swirling, but then something really, the thought pattern comes and what do we do? Yeah. And, and there are places to be more analytical. I mean, it's, it's maybe not like the kind of classic mindfulness practice where we're experience trying you know building a non-conceptual relationship to whatever experiences arising in the body or the mind but there is also a place for what you know when we say weather pattern what does that mean it means that these are very real phenomena that have a lot of force that have a lot of you know but and that have a, a, a huge variety of expression based on conditions right and then when and the conditions that cause a tornado to arise versus a rainbow or sunny day or whatever are very incredibly complex and and vast and that you can start to get a sense of like well what are the you know conditions that that keep arising in the heart and mind maybe in the body you know in terms of around these um patterns that you're encountering and Yes, there are tools that we have to kind of like puncture those or build a little. Sometimes there is a sense of like um, 
a barrier, a boundary, right? The firmness with the mind of like, just we're stopping this, you know, because you see that it's not healthy and, and that you can't investigate it without getting caught up in it. Uh, and that that's important to realize at times where it's just like a firmness with like, no, we're not, we're not getting involved in this and you bring the attention elsewhere or, or what have you. Um, but that there's other times where it is more investigative in a direct way, right? Of seeing it's like, oh, there's an emotion, there's a thought, there's an insecurity, there's fear of the future, there's a pain of the past, whatever it is, right? And you start to see the kind of building blocks of a of a system, you know, weather system that arises in the heart. And, you know, um, that understanding can help certainly unhook, but also like, just understand why these things arise in any of us, you know, and what are the sort of like, you know, pieces of the puzzle that, that cause certain things to arise and what causes it to dissipate. Um, and that sometimes there might be a more kind of analytical approach to that as well. Yeah. This is so helpful. I can just feel my, uh, my heart, mind kind of loosening up a little bit hearing this. So yeah, thank you so much. I'll take this into my practice. Thank you. Great, Suzanne. Is that Tim with BVL? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Hi, yeah. Tim. Hi. <laughs> Hi to both of you. Um, this is just sort of a personal comment. This is very much a non-anata comment, which is that today is my 75th birthday, and <laughs> I made it. And um, I, I'm, I'm just feeling, a I, I, you know, I can't tell you, I've known both of you for a very, very, very long time. And I'm just feeling a lot of gratitude. I don't have a lot to say, but I guess I'm saying I'm 75, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Happy birthday, Tim. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think I've known you 40, 40. I think I've known you 41 years. I, we, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, I have a PhD in this, if you want to split hairs. We met in 85. We okay. Did, I did five, three months. Okay, then 39 you. years, something like that. Something like yeah. that. And of course, I did all those three-month courses year after year after year. Right, year. right. That Jesse, I great. met you as early as 20 nine so i mean it's i've known you for 15 at least so but you know i mean there's not a lot to say uh obviously you know or there's a tremendous amount but you know i have more you know mortality issues and what is it all meant uh but the fact that both of you were there for me as kind of um not just guides and teachers but as sort of presences i mean it's just so nice to know that there are other people who are doing this and are doing this tre with tremendous courage and integrity. And then of course, you know, I mean, one of the things as I've gotten older is I'm realizing I get strength from other people and I also lose strength from other people, but I have friends who absolutely inspire me and get me to keep moving. And I suppose the opposite could be true to it's all a bummer, yeah, you know, and that's, that's also out there, right? And you don't want to buy into it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, I love both of you. And I just want to say, I mean, that's it. That's, that's the communication. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm very impressed you made it to 75, Tim. You know, I'm, I'm behind you trying to crawl up there with you. So, catch up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Really, congratulations. Yeah, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. But blessing. You guys both have been, yeah arguably the most important people in my life. I mean, that's, that's all I can love say. Oh, so, yeah. I love you, Tim. Thank I love you, you too, yeah. Michelle. Yeah. Hmm. I think it's like really, um, this piece around relationship, you know, I, I, I just get how important it is for us, you know, and, and over time to be able to like, keep in contact with people and especially since covid and the online stuff i mean it, it was amazing that this has been able to persist and and in some ways like strengthen right i mean there was you know we'd see you or many folks like once a year and now there's like a consistency that um you know has its limitations and there it's not you know it's not like we're hanging out every day or every week or whatever but there's there's just something so important 
in terms of this, I mean, I think just like what you're saying of like, you, you cannot, we cannot do this alone. You know, this work is so hard and the amount of vulnerability and the amount of like, when we're really realistic of what a, a high mountain it is to climb and how, you know, just all the skills that we need training in and, um, and just what it means to have relationships over many years. Thank, thank you, Jesse. Because I think for yeah. me, particularly as I get older and older and older, right, and I have my own health issues, what's coming to me is how incredibly important my presence can be for other people whom I'm trying to support who maybe have worse illnesses than I do. But again, how, how I mean, a sense it goes both ways. Someone who is tremendously courageous and is dealing with stuff and keeps a positive attitude, that inspires me. That keeps me going. Mm. And I suppose the alternative would be, you know, walking around being depressed all day and I'm identified, you know, I identify with every ache and pain in my body. And let me tell you, it is hard. <laughs> it is really, really hard. And there are people like that. And, you know, and they just drain your energy. They take away from you. So anyway, I don't have a lot more to say, but God bless both of you. I mean, you know, hey, I love you. So that's it, I guess. I love you too, Tim. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And that's interesting. You always, you know, I've I've always had a lot of sympathy for the people, of course, who have like their birthdays on Christmas or, you know, whatever. <laughs> okay. But New Year's is an interesting. I could see that not being as well, I well, my know. joke it's was complicated in its own way. <laughs> yeah. Well, it wasn't until I was 25 that I realized all those people in Times Square weren't there for me. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, Tim. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Let's see. Kay. Kay. Hey, Kay. Hey. Um, <laughs> Uh, I I'm having I mean it's been a while but um not much works in terms of I don't know what works um things doesn't go as I kind of want to or expect in the same way uh anchoring or anything um any Brahma Vihara practice those things are being working doesn't work anymore and it's awesome and that's I think I understand why and the change of conditions and everything but um I just I just wanted to ask when in text there's uh appearance of Mara and uh, there's some a lot of interpretation are in a war metaphors and um to get rid of or like to uh abandon uproot um and i i started to feel um uh, I decided to wonder if there's any way to like actually like, uh, bring whatever this personal personification of all oh, that attachment like into my life. I mean, it's already there, but um, I, I just see a lot of houseless people, and I I want to support them, and at the same time. Uh, I don't want them like there is a like really true honest part that like I don't want them um I don't want grief or I don't want suicidality I don't want fear um and at the same time I'm noticing that like I don't know I don't even know what it would be like without those um those things like I uh, distraction or sleepiness or even um restlessness those things are I kind of want them near now because that actually take a lot off my shoulder. Um, and consequence, like, um, 
really easy to guess. It's been really hard because it's just hard to be with them. Um, I think original question, my, my question came because I've been wondering who Mara was and that led to what I said, I think, but yeah. Just a question around when you say that it's not, the, the tools aren't working, but then it also sounded like you felt that it was, I can't tell if you feel like that's a problem or not, or if that you're okay with it working. You're, you're okay. I'm, you're like, I'm okay with, because yeah. I can see in a way, like it's just showing up in a different way that like I might not notice uh, in the beginning or I might. Um, and I thought it was a virgin, but it was actually um just really sweet uh, softness. Or so it's it's. Uh, I'm not saying that the practice or like any method is not working. I think I'm just not seeing it as I would have expected for many, you know, uh, with practice and what I've heard and. Um, all those things and it's just difficult <laughs> mm -hmm. it's disheartening sometimes because it's sometimes amazing to see that like to see the oh what a great the capacity to feel really happy for other people um it's amazing and, and at the same time it's it feels so draining um and I can see myself drowning all the time. And that's became part of my life too. And it's kind of interesting and I can just swim in that <laughs> maybe, but yeah, it's just becomes, I think I, I'm not exactly adjusting to different changes because I want it to be in a certain way, of course. And, um, yeah, and I was just wondering if there was any other, like, a different interpretation of those things that um, this evil person, um, yeah. or what happened, or um, who they were, or there was, like, any other relationship um those two figures had before or um yeah a little yeah, more context sure. I guess I mean I think in some it sounds like you're just you're it's it's that like maturing in your practice you know where I think in some ways there is a sense of like when we start and for many years and and always to some degree there is the framework of you know, difficult, you know, the hindrances or the armies of Mara, the enemy, the problems, right? And that you address them through their opposites, through love and through wisdom and compassion. And there is this, you know, a sort of like dialectical kind of framing of it, right? Where this arises, so you throw the opposite at it. Um, and there is always a place for that in, in the on many levels, you know, of the practice and a spiritual journey. And, you know, it has its place, that sort of polarized black and white kind of dynamic. Um, and then I think that you have a taste for something that's more complex and also true, you know, which is, which is which is that there is a story about Mara, and I don't remember all the details. Michelle may remember more, but that that Mara in many past lives was a relative of the Buddha, and um, that there are places where you see there's a sympathy for Mara, right? That that Mara as is, is a deva that is you know confused and and complicated case for sure, but but part of his problem is like he he doesn't when he sees people getting enlightened he feels like he's being abandoned you know 
and that that there he won't have people with him in samsara. And so there is a sense of like wanting people to stay in samsara because of his own fear of being left alone, you know, behind. And and so there's something very, I don't want to say human, but there's something very relatable in that, you know, that this is not just some two-dimensional archetype, right? That this is like a being that's complicated. And that and that the all the uh the other side of that is also what you're pointing at. As we look at the so-called hindrances, sleepiness, restlessness, ill will, all of them, doubt, it's like you start to see that, yes, on one hand, they are, mm, they can help, they can keep their, their the opposite experiences of calm, concentration, equanimity, energy, all of these other things. But on the other hand, exactly as you said, you see that they're protecting us from overwhelming painful experiences, right? that sleepiness or the dullness or doubt sometimes are are ways that the heart and mind are protecting us from degrees of intense emotional experience that we don't yet have the ability to be mindful with. And so when the mindfulness or the concentration isn't strong in that moment, these other tools arise and that we actually don't need to fight them, that we can respect them and that they're actually okay. And that you don't need to always have this kind of war framework or metaphor you know towards how we're relating to it i think this is like for us yes that's exactly right and it is a maturing of the practice it isn't to say that there is we just reject the the battle metaphors because there are times where those are you know energizing and they have their place but there's also this other side of it of um mm, as we maybe identify Mara as a being, like you're saying, is like, is there is there a place for saying like, oh, this is Mara for some internal experience? It's like, yes, that it, but it doesn't have to be identifying with or against, but that there is a resonance there of, um, you know, a pattern of being, a way of being that uses, you know, that has patterns in our hearts that are not always like the most <laughs> the most that we aspire to, but they're understandable, you know, and that they have their place. And we understand and actually by caring for them rather than trying to rip them out that we have, we develop a very different relationship with them. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess I just feel like, yeah, you know, I really, I feel like, you know, what you're offering feels really resonant. It feels like a, you know, a more complex and rich, response to to the realities we encounter you know in our practice sometimes you you it can we we miss that clarity of like oh well just do this and just do that and there's like you know it's 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 more nuanced and it's um it's not as paint by numbers you know but and so it's harder it requires a more you know more work and more depth and more maturity of our own kind of actions, but that you're, but that it also only arises when your my heart, mind system is, you know, ready for it. Um, yeah. Michelle, do you have anything you want to, oh, you're, you're muted again. Right. Um, I think that, um, the interesting thing that I think that Kay, you brought up and that Jesse you're talking about, which is really important, which is um, how we relate to something like we hear about Mara and then to figure out more and more our relationship to Mara in terms of um, the different ways we're talking about it, right? So that if you start to, um, I think for modern Westerners, the idea that Mara is a being, like re is a being versus a concept, right? Um, or, or an archetypal con con um, construct, then you can eventually bring it to yourself, which is that we have Mara in us, right? Like there's a part of us that gets lonely. <laughs> And what doesn't want to get enlightened because we don't want to leave 
right? So it's not just that there's a Mara that's... Do you see what I'm saying? That you, you keep playing with it in terms of its influence and that another influence would be just... Just like to see, you know, the question Aiken Roshi asked me years ago, how old is Kuan Yin? The koan, how old is Kuan Yin? Well, how old is Mara? Right, like how... <laughs> yeah, f okay, right? Like, yeah, there's a part of us that is that. There's a part of us that is Kuan Yin or Mara. And that when, y when we can... Um, and I think play with it in that way, just like Jesse's offering and you're... you're playing with, I think it's really important because the first time I heard Mara being described as a cousin of the Buddha, it just completely changed my relationship to it. Completely. It was like, oh my God, that's so cool. Like, it's like <laughs> there's a family tree over, over lifetimes. And, um, you know, I have a neighbor that seems a little bit like Mara. You know what I mean? You know? <laughs> And I don't know, you know, I just think it's so important to take responsibility for understanding uh, these teachings in a more relational way, in that way. Yeah, and yeah, I, I'm not mad about, you know, uh, <laughs> how I'm dealing with or like how I've learned to um relate to those the classic teaching or my own experience and i'm just finding hard to navigate even relationally like in like most intense things like they're just telling my psychiatrist that like oh i just won't have different relationship with my suicidality that that doesn't ring well um, for a lot of people, I I want to make um different relationship with my grief, and that does not that almost sound like um I'm always depressed and <laughs> I'm just um drowning in depressed that that depression that translates into that um and I I lose opportunity to actually have a conversation with a lot of people and. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not, um, I'm not discouraged. I'm not, um, within the practice, I'm not discouraged. I'm not exactly hopeful, but I, I'd love to stay stuck, stick around if, you know, Mara wants <laughs> some people, um, behind, I, I'd like to be that one. <laughs> That'd be cool. Like, that's a good friend yeah <laughs> that's a good cousin oh. yeah. <laughs> you know there's one other part of this that i don't know how to totally go into it but it's like the word expectation you used it and i think that um it's such a powerful word and it, it's um I do think there are places in practice, which again, Jesse alluded to at the beginning of what he was saying for you in terms of you've been, you've been at this a long time. And often there are places where really everything that all the tools we've kind of cultivated don't work anymore. It really is. It's like these... Um, just part of the journey that like that the... the, the I see them as times of like a free fall where there's, um, it, it's a more tangible metaphor for me to offer, but it's like um, if you're rock climbing <laughs> and, you know, you, you, you hit a place where there's, there's nothing to hold on to. But it, you have had many things to hold on to up to that point, but it's like there's nothing nothing um they call it free fall and it's i think of it as a powerful stage of life and practice within it which is that it's it's i think of it as a time where you kind of have to wait and often you're waiting for a different kind of motivation to appear that's newer that's that's based on all your experience so far and based on all your hard work, but it's not um, clear 
it's just not clear. You wait until something becomes like motivating um, that is beyond the expectation of what your former practice has given you. Does that does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, yeah, and, and then, I. Yep. And you miss it. Yeah, you mi like it's hard. It's really hard. You miss all the things that have been working. And um, that's when you need to get ask us for at least encouragement because we don't just hit these places once. Like it, I think of them as times where we've, by, we've been digesting a lot of material and it's digested, actually. And it's like time for... <laughs> Time for a free fall. Mm -hmm. So you need you need. I'm glad you asked because we often need a lot of encouragement to um, get through those periods. Mm -hmm. I want to say something. It's a little. It's. I'm not sure how important a part of what you're saying, hey, this is, but it feels like I want to, I just, I want to say something about it, which is on one hand, part of the practice is like, you know, we, we have a, a such a solid sense of meanness, right? I, identity and who I am and this sort of like, this thing that feels, that can feel very fixed or, or very solid. And part of the practice is, is, of course, coming to sort of see the lack of solidity of that, the, the lack of coherence around that. Not that we don't exist, but that that kind of, you know, the solidity of that is also an illusion. And, and so this like seeing thoughts as weather patterns, right? But then there is also the something that has been lost. <sighs> Well, I think one of the one of the great faults of like Western Buddhism at this point, as I sort of see it, is the lack of acknowledgement of other beings, uh, of spirit beings, of the devas, of like uh, that it that it has become something in its sort of lack of trying to kind of get away from the trappings of religion that people may be kind of like hesitant about or you know trying to get rid of or or whatever you know that that there is also loss of something that's like very real in the text <laughs> around like the, these other beings that do exist right and and different kinds of beings that might not be visible in like all the sort of normal material ways that we're used to experiencing what we think of as real but then does that mean that we add that conceptual framework onto experience or do we sort of just do we honor it? Do we respect it? I don't think I have like a clear encouragement except for there is that other sense of like, well, when do you see a weather pattern as thought, right? Where it's like, that's why it's like weather patterns often have like externally, right? They have a, a feeling that they're menacing or they have a feeling that they are benevolent, right? And so that there's not the sense of like, well, what what is the beingness of this storm in you know that that might come through when I and, and like rainstorm or snowstorm or whatever right or or of this forest or of this tree or of this stone I think that it is an important it can be a very important part of our practice is the acknowledgement of other forms of being and at the same time does that mean that we artificially construct it on purpose without necessarily a sense that it's like something we're interacting with. I don't know, you know? So I think this the question of whether you want to start calling this Mara, these certain experiences or these certain things, it's like, check it out. I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. like it's worth exploring. It's worth exploring of like, do we start to be like, well, this is, we're going to start kind of constructing the sense of another being, or do we have a sense that there are other beings that we're in relationship with, even if it's very subtle? Um, because I do feel like that that is, um, it's important. 
because that acknowledgement of the different forms that beings can take or that being can express itself in, you know, there, there are been like, you know, modern schools of whatever, I don't know what they are, but they would talk about like, you know, maybe, maybe consciousness just exists in matter, no matter what the table, the, you know, cause they don't really understand how does like our experience of consciousness relate to the matter of brain, you know, like, where is this, where is this sense of me coming from in relationship to this mush in our skull, you know, um, it's not like totally not understood. And so is there a sense that things have presence, right? Things that there's maybe not the same kind of consciousness we have, but consciousness may be something that we can relate to on different levels in a way that also helps us break down the sense of meanness or mm-hmm. else otherness. Um, and that's that breaking it down where it's not, you don't necessarily need to be creating a sense of other, but it's also not necessarily me. I just think that there's sort of like powerful work and important work to do there. And that if it's like something that is a uh, exploration that's worth it's worth exploring, you know? Yeah. 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 I hear that hundred percent and I can feel already around like plants and nature and animals and how much they do know and how much do I know and how much that's not even uh, a part of conversation conceptually and, but still exists. Like it's, it is great place to practice. Thank you. Totally. Yeah. And, and I would say in terms of the practice, to what degree is ritual a part of your, our practice and i do think that there is something in that you know i mean i'll just say that it's like what you know one of the when i was in bolivia you know the the family that helped find me this um the these friends and their family who helped me find this place to sit for the month you know they didn't know about my practice like they don't buddhism and it was not familiar to them but there was an understanding that i was doing something in the realm that they respect And so before the retreat, like the the whole family gathered at this house and we made offerings Mm -hmm. to the spirits of the place. And we, they had a blessing of me and of the house. And it was like a very clear thing. Like, this is just what you do. You know, it's like, if you're going to go sit, like we we're going to make sure that it's Pono, right. As you'd say in Hawaii. And so that sense of like, it doesn't always have to be a big production, but it can be. But I think it's like also where are the ways, like you're saying with the plant or with the tree or where are we acknowledging that? Um, especially because the human world can be so taxing and so the patterning around our like interpretation and like the dynamics are just like so locked in that sometimes there's like more fluidity with a tree, you know, like you said, animals. So that it's like that that place of where you might find a more like kind of refreshing exploration of these things. I just I, I really feel like is important and and really has a lot of potential. Yeah. And protective. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thanks, Kay. Mm. Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen. So I've experienced a lot of grief this past year. Um, At one point I looked online and found that three of the top five stressors were happening in my life all at once. And I've just been looking really deeply at the grief and letting it be my teacher. Um, It's brought up a lot of pain that I've carried for a very long time. You know, not just the specific grief, for example, around the loss of my father, but it's it's brought up a lot of other pain that's I think kind of been in there for a long time. And for a while, a lot of these um, tsunamis of difficult emotion were happening when I was actually sitting. And I just was learning how to practice with them. At some level, it's purification because of all the practice that I've been doing. Now, it's more quiet when I'm sitting 
and there's a lot more wisdom. But in my daily life, these tsunamis of incredibly difficult emotions are just flowing through and they're they're incredibly painful and they're harder to practice with because I can be driving on the highway going 70 miles an hour and all of a sudden it, it's coming through. So I'm just wondering if you have any ideas or if there's anything different in terms of what I might do when these things are happening in daily life. Maybe there is. I'd pull over into the middle lane and go 50 miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe even 40, go over to the, which on the Mass Pike, which highway are we talking about? <laughs> well, in this case, I was driving from South Carolina down to Florida. And the speed limit is 70. Uh-huh. Well, I think there's a, but I think metaphorically, miles per hour is always an interesting um, thing to look at because clearly slowing down a little bit would probably help, right? Like even though, but it, it's, it really and truly that it, um, sometimes it's better to just pull over and stop. So yeah. it just depends on how big a tsunami is happening, but it, it, it's fine to stop or to slow down. It's a kind of respect again for the emotion and how strong it is. I think it's a good sign. I think that it's not happening the way it was. It means that it's much more on the surface. That's like instead of it just happening when you're sitting, it's like that's kind of done its place and it's done its work and now it's more on the surface and it's just kind of um, more accessible as one would say. <laughs> right which is great I mean it's just it's just when it's unpleasant and painful and actually in a car you might have more space for it than if you were somewhere working or you know home with a bunch of people or actually a highway is a great place to do work on ourselves I think <laughs> you know <laughs> really you got all that time you can turn on the radio if you don't want to be with it you know, it's like there's a lot of options in a car. Um, you can break, so you just want to be careful and not um, careless or risky. Um, but I think the deeper question is, when stuff is that accessible, it just means you have to go with it. There's not much choice, right? I, it's not like you want to. I, it's like stopping a tsunami. You can't stop a tsunami. You you have warning signals and you try to be safe, right? Yeah. And a lot of the way that I practiced with it when I was actually sitting is um, it shows up for me sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. You know, I can just see that it's like a combination of anger and despair and sadness all happening at the same time, you know. And the other day I was getting takeout and I got back in the car and it just kind of took over and I was like, okay, I'm just going to sit here. I'm not, I'm not, I shouldn't be driving right now. I'm just going to sit here and practice with it. Right. That's so great. I mean, you know, we're lucky we have cars, you know, we can, <laughs> Modern people do have some benefits, and one of them is a car. Like, you can just go in and roll up the windows and drive somewhere and scream. Like, there, there are a lot of <laughs> options. Really? You don't have to scream in the middle of the city where people can hear it. But there are ways that it helps us find a place to go to, to feel what we're feeling. I mean, so much of it is the training not to feel our what we're feeling is so intense around this stuff that it's like healing generations. You're he it's like healing generations to feel that level of pain. Yeah. And I, the way that I've been practicing with the grief, I, there's just so much conditioning in my family around um, putting a lid on all of those emotions. I'm actually happy that they're showing up. It's Great. almost like yeah. I'm a teenager again before I got squashed all the time when I was 
experiencing a lot of those emotions. I feel like I, that's kind of how I feel right now, right? Yeah. Yay. I think the only thing I will say is like you also, and, and that in particular is helpful, right? Like the, the kind of like the teenager quality. It's like, you there's not a there's not a um there's not like a cookie cutter answer to say yeah just let it rip just like always let it rip you know like no matter no matter what's happening just that that you're just always going to let some explosive emotion burn through you like that's actually not necessarily skillful i mean i think that so you have to, like the other side of it is it's like that if there is a if you are are potentially going to harm yourself or harm someone else right that like whether you're on the highway going 70 miles an hour and this it's like actually you want to be careful you know and that like it's there are there you that you are not always beholden to the tsunami that arises that actually you have some capacity to say no not now and that you because you actually don't have the ability to feel it in a healthy way to that the context in which you're in might not actually be appropriate for expression of like you know teenage rage like that that might be that there is that other side and that you want to be careful as well that the 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 point of the practice is not always just like making ourselves more and more porous and less and less it's like if you feel like you can feel these waves of emotion and that they are that it's fruitful and that it's healthy and that they're mindful of them right and that you are aware of what's happening and that you're learning from it then yeah it's like amazing that that you doesn't have to just happen in your sitting practice right that it can happen throughout our lives and that if if you feel protected enough and you feel like others are protected enough in that situation then it's it's very powerful to to move through life in a way that is less that doesn't need to be always kind of like containing right in that way and to be careful about the teenage impulse towards recklessness right if that is what's what's also part of what's happening that you also have to see that there's you know to to that you're not just a hundred percent beholden either to like whatever storm that arises you know that you also have the ability to like manage and um, know when you are actually in a place to be able to like have a healthy relationship with what's coming up, you know? And so that like the life is not just getting more and more volatile. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the compassion or just the, of course, you know, this is what I'm experiencing right now, given what I'm going through in my life sometimes that's available and sometimes it's it's not you know i do i do think that the most uh adult way is how well, we've been talking about it and the most safe and protective is always um the clear it's clear comprehensive clear comprehension of purpose which is why i said you can get in a car and really make a decision even about if something's coming up. That's why I thought I made a joke about it, but it, I'm serious. It's like when you have, um, I used to joke about with myself um, when I used, when I had this stuff happening, um, where I, I, <laughs> I would say oh, to myself, oh, this is kind of coming up primitively, meaning it's just like that's why there is a lid on it because no one could witness it with you in the first place. Like there was such resistance. I mean, that, that's what I mean by the conditioning is to stuff it. So when it comes up, it's not pretty, it's messy. It's so messy. And it's like, it. I think it is helpful to have a clear comprehension and to, to see like where, where is it, is there space enough to deal with this? And can I get it? And if not, to be very careful. Yeah, I think that that's why, um, there's a lid on all this stuff in the first place <laughs> in the human world because <laughs> yeah. it's mess it's messy 
and there isn't all the tools that we have to to get a relationship with it and to, for it not to be destructive yeah it's great it's a, it's a um and so sometimes it's seeing is there a place nearby where i can pull over so i can be with this or do is there something else i need to do to help myself in this moment right another way to practice with it right right and, and it's always going to be the things you already understand. I mean, that's what's cool is like what what is going to help are tools that are just translated from your practice, right? It's like it might not be that you go sit in a formal meditation posture, but there's a sense of like, oh, seclusion, of quiet, of letting go of external responsibility. You know, there's all the things that we learn from our meditation practice or being on retreat. These are these are tools that do translate, you know? And then, so, yeah, it's like, you don't have to come, they're not going to come out of nowhere, you know, like that you're, you have a sense of what are the, what are the conditions externally and internally that are going to help you be able to be with a, a tsunami that's coming through in a, in a healthy way, you know? And sometimes it is just cranking some loud music, right? And it might not look like Vipassana practice, but it's like, Yes, you're gonna you get how you're gonna need to ride this wave at this point. And other times it means pulling off the road and like you know staring into space for 20 minutes or whatever, or screaming or whatever it might be, you know. Or just closing my eyes and being in my body, which you can't do when you're driving. <laughs> right. Right. Aww. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Good <laughs> point. Your eyes. You might be able to be in your body, but <laughs> Thank you. But, that, but it's exactly that, that sense of like, when you're driving, you you get how responsible you are to the external world. And if you're pulled over and stopped and the sense of what, that the responsibility doesn't have to be external, that you can kind of bring, pull it inward. And exactly, you know, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I, I just want to say to the safety, the safety in this practice is the mindfulness, you know, the seven factors, the um, Brahma Viharas, it's all the safety to get a relationship with something that we have been taught isn't okay to feel in this context. And so when you don't have a relationship some, with something, it actually has great power over us and we aren't safe. You're not safe when it comes up because you, you're not protected, right? And so that what's so cool is that you're starting to see that you need to do something to get yourself in a place where you are safe enough to actually cultivate the relationship. Yeah, and when I do that, I find that the next morning when I'm sitting, the wisdom comes. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And and I do want to say, I think it's just a, a fantastic sign that like what you're describing, like if we were just to say like the death of your father, never mind the other intense stressors in your life, this, this idea that it, it comes in waves, right? That it isn't just like prescribed to like a certain period after like someone dies or and you go through like tick, 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 and you check it off or it just happens you're sitting. It's like these waves arise out of what's maybe seem to be nowhere or these very subtle phenomena, like that that is something very beautiful, right? That your system is not suppressing that, right? That you are you are attuned and alert to like this very vibrant process of grief that is like so immense and unbelievable. It's like beyond fathoming, right? The amount of energy that can move through us in a moment. Um, and it's really, that just, it's great. It's great. It feels great that that's happening, you know? And and that you're trying to find your way through it responsibly, you know, Re responsible to like your, your life and keeping your life together and being a functional person, but also like honoring your heart's process with what's happening. Well, I feel like I can do it because I've been practicing so much with both of you. I have really, really learned so much and I'm very deeply grateful. And from everyone here, right? Just listening. Mm -hmm. when a, yeah. It's incredible. Totally, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It is incredible. Yeah. There's less and less fear. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you, everybody. Hmm. 
Oh, we're rolling into 2024. <laughs> 170 miles an hour. <laughs> Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And we'll hopefully see you next Sunday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Take care, everyone.